Welcome to episode 173 of the Fertility Podcast, which I'm sharing a little later than usual, and I'll explain for why. If this is your first listen to the Fertility Podcast, I'm Natalie Silverman, your host. Welcome. Do spend a bit of time having a look around the fertilitypodcast.com if there's a specific topic you want to know more about. I hopefully will have covered it because I've been making this podcast now for just over four years. And I normally publish first thing on a Monday. This episode's going out a little bit later. This weekend just gone, talking mid-March 2019, my little boy, Phoenix, turned four. If you've heard this podcast before, you'll know my story. If you haven't, um, Phoenix was the result of ICSI treatment and he is a, a brilliant little boy. He has featured as an exec producer at times on this podcast. So we had his birthday on Saturday and then on Sunday I had a very sad day. It was the memorial of my late auntie and it was a a really sad, at the same time, beautiful day as wonderful words about her were spoken. But it um, was quite emotionally draining for me and my plans to get this finished were put on hold. So I hope you understand and appreciate that. And one thing that... I wanted to just share in memory of my late auntie Melissa who like I say was a phenomenal lady where she dedicated um, her life to teaching and educating and it felt really poignant for me to share a bit of her memory in this work I do with this podcast because ultimately that's what I want to do in the content I share with you I want it to be useful I want it to help you maybe ask more questions which is part of her legacy and when you are struck with the loss of somebody suddenly and it is a real shock and the ripple effects of it are really far reaching and you realize how precious life is and how vital it is to tell the people that are important to you that you love them to make the most of every day to do the right thing to make the right decisions for you to have some self-protection and also to reach out for help if you need it it's important to take stock and I think I'm just feeling today very emotional very raw to some extent reminds me of of the vulnerability that we all feel and I know that so many of you do keep this to yourself you maybe don't tell your family members and that's why I just want to reiterate the community that is available to you if you're not yet following me on different socials I'm at fertility poddy on Instagram on Twitter the fertility podcast has a page on Facebook and I have a closed Facebook group called talk fertility so if you aren't able to talk to people close to you and you are feeling pretty out on a limb dealing with all of this please please don't feel you are alone okay and If you're anywhere in the north of England, do check out, especially on my Instagram, details of an event that I'm involved with in a couple of weeks, 23rd of March, around the fertility show where I'm hosting uh, the Let's Talk Fertility stage. Come and say hello to me, please. It'd be ace to meet you. And I'm involved in this series of events that's going to be happening across the next coming months in the north of England to, um, again, demonstrate that you're really not alone with what it is that you're going through. Now, um, before we go on to my show today, a little note from my sponsors. Do have a listen to my sponsors' messages because I try to find people that I think will be of interest to you and they're doing some really amazing work to help support you. And this podcast wouldn't happen if it wasn't for them, to be completely honest. This podcast is sponsored by International Andrology, who specialise in diagnosing and treating male infertility. Around 50% of infertility issues are male factor, and all too often, men aren't even evaluated at the start of a fertility journey, which might result in unnecessary treatments, costs, and disappointment. International Andrology is one of the few specialist clinics in the UK, offering a holistic approach to increase your chances to conceive naturally or via the IVF route. As well as treating the underlying causes of male infertility, their doctors have some of the highest success rates in microsurgical sperm retrieval. So, if you're looking for a true specialist to assist you on your fertility journey, visit london-andrology.co.uk today and do mention the Fertility Podcast. The Fertility Podcast is also sponsored by Apricity, a virtual clinic of a new kind. Apricity offers first-class fertility care 
as unique as you. Get support from your Apricity advisor seven days a week. Stay in the know with the app's guidance and reminders. Customise your journey at no extra cost. Apricity is fertility care your way. Find out more at apricity.life forward slash podcast. I just want to explain a little bit about it because I've been sharing my alternative parenting season and my next guest is a guy called Adam Hooper. Now Adam got in touch with me in response to an episode I'd shared with Dr Larissa Corder about unregulated sperm donation websites in the UK. I will put a link to this episode in the show notes so you can have a listen and know what we're talking about because we do refer to it at at a couple of points in our chat. Now, Adam was kind of angry when he first contacted me and I was keen to talk more. This podcast is all about sharing information, helping you understand more about different areas and issues affecting your fertility. And I want to be as objective as I can. Now, I'm not a trained journalist. I've kind of become more of a content creator and a producer and a journalist as I've been making more content. And when I was talking to Adam, I felt quite strongly that I needed another viewpoint in this episode, which you'll hear at the end. It's a comment that I got from Kevin McElhenney, who is a male fertility doctor, who again, I've spoken to on this podcast, and I'll put a link to our chat where he was giving you some really brilliant information about male fertility issues. I just wanted to see what Kevin thought about some of the comments that Adam made, especially if this is your first listen to any content or this is part of your research into sperm donation okay so do have a listen to the end to hear what kevin has to say and i'll put all the details of the show notes at the end and how you can get in touch too so for now enjoy you're going to hear from adam as well as johanna who is a swedish lady who's traveled to australia to be a recipient of adam's sperm donation and i apologize because the quality of this chat wasn't great they were in australia in an airbnb there was a weird fan going on that i think was causing some interference that we've tried to get rid of but yeah you can hear it so sorry about that so first up here's adam Hey, Natalie, yes, could have came across a bit angry, but no, I'm happy, I'm a happy person, so um, yeah, I'm happy to be here and chat with you today. Well, because you'd made the point that I was kind of scaremongering and that um, we needed to understand more about people who donate, sperm donors, and so I wanted to understand more about you because your story is pretty unique you are a sperm donor and as a result of donating have now got this incredible website spermdonorsaustralia.com uh, au we'll put all the details on the show notes so you you'd made the point about these websites there when we'd spoken and you said that initially when you'd started out you had come across some dodgy stuff so just tell me about what got you into this world Okay, so look, um, look uh, my wife worked with um, a couple of people that were looking to have a child and um, they were looking for a donor, which initially planted the seed in my head. I, did, I didn't help them, um, but it had me, had me thinking. And um, so then I started to look into it um, after my second child was born. I, I'm a father of two, two um, lovely daughters. And, um, you know, so after being a dad, it's a, you know, it's a, I knew how special it was to be a parent. And I knew there was other people out there that um, you know needed required assistance to um, uh, to have a family, and and everyone in my family lives to around ninety plus, and you know re- relatively with no health issues. So for me, it was easy for me to it's an easy candidate to um, to do all this, and so I looked into it. And then when I first started, um, I was the twenty seventh member on a, an Australian site, so it was very. Um, you could say it wasn't very um, full throttle back then. It was quite an underground sort of thing. But the men that were around on it were, you know, obviously um, trying to take advantage um, and, you know, want sex and all that sort of stuff. And and for me, it wasn't like, you know, I didn't want to be associated with that sort of those sort of people. So I created my own Facebook group. So I don't know how sperm donors Australia dot com that I use sperm donation Australia. Yeah. So from there, I wanted to individually screen each donor that came in. So I would speak to them, get a feel of them, um, you know, tell them what's acceptable, what's not acceptable, the right terminology. And, you know, pretty much it was just an um, evaluation psych test of um, seeing how these men were. Because back in the past, we had a lot of men that joined and they didn't like what it represented, so they quickly left. So we weren't, 
you know, the, all the bad eggs were staying around and the good eggs, you know, would, were like, I don't want to be associated with this. So I've created um, a community now that allows um, men from all work, 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 uh, works of life to be donors. Like we've, we've got um, in our group, we've had doctors that have, have donated. We've had uh, firefighters, federal police officers. Um, we've had a scientist, a neurologist, um, you know, all respectable um, people. Um, you know, in, that would be seen as um, you know a high level in society, um, and for the women as well. Like this is what sort of boils my, uh, my bones is, is um, you know Larissa the other day is sort of um, saying, oh these women go to these sites because they're desperate and don't have money, and this is not the case. You know, there's women like Joanna out there that would rather travel the world and come over here and use fresh sperm rather than using frozen. She thinks this offers a better value for her. And, and th this is a shared opinion for many women um, all around the world and specifically in Australia. People have share their experience that um, they're having positive, a positive experience. So they're telling their friends and their family and word of mouth is spreading. And yeah, we've, we've established something that's really um, something to be proud of. Let's just hold on a sec, because you've mentioned Johanna, who we're going to speak to in a moment. Johanna's with you and she's Swedish. She's come to Australia to work with you as a sperm donor. But I just want to go back to the point you'd made about Larissa. Dr. Larissa Corder was my guest on the previous episode where she was talking about her experience of UK based websites, the unregulated nature of them and had done an investigative piece. So I just want to highlight that Larissa isn't here to talk about that before we kind of talk too much about it in that we were keen to explore what was going on around the world and it's something that I do want to talk about more and Adam I think it might even be a, a, another conversation that we have with Larissa as the experience that she's had because I'm the third party in this mix but one of the things that I wanted to pick up with with you with with some of the points that you'd raised with me was you're talking about the good eggs and the bad eggs and the, the way that men are feeling about doing this kind of thing you talked about men who have donated directly to clinics having kind of later issues with it whereas men who might donate on a site seem more at ease with what they're doing or they're they're less concerned about the children that they're creating tell me a bit about the experience of the donors that you're working with how they feel about what it is they're doing yeah so you know obviously a part of me doing that screening process and I have ongoing contact with um, the donors in my group and stuff like that um, you know I get to um, learn a lot about the psychology of it all and I've um, I've spoken to a lot of um, donors that donated at the clinics in the 1980s the 1990s where it was more anonymous where um, where the clinics told the um, people involved um, not to speak about it and pretend they you know so there's a lot of people that don't know that their donor conceived and these men as well that have donated they said yeah like you know originally we did a um, it went you know it was in the back of the mind but after a few years it starts to manifest um, it, with the, and play on their mind of like oh I wonder if these children are going to a good home I wonder if you know I wonder what they got my eyes or what features they have or my personality and it's um, so these men once, um, you know, you got 18, 18 years plus before they turn 18 and to, to their possibly reconnected, if not at all, um, going out there searching for their donor children and vice versa as well. A lot of donor children go searching for the, um, their donor and there's more of an attachment because there's that, um, you know, obviously it's been building up for such a long time that they're more fascinated with each other. Whereas um, what I'm finding is with online donation is, is you know, I get to meet people like Joanna. I get to um, go to lunch with them. Um, we sit down, we chat, we talk about the values, what we think is best for the child and um, a registry system that I created and, um, you know, so it avoids um, um, ancestral um, relations, unknown ancestral relations from happening. You know, so we got all that covered and we speak about it and then, you know, Joanna can be like, well, this guy's a decent guy, or any other donor in particular. So, for instance, they can say, this guy's, you know, I feel comfortable with this guy. There's a lot of angst with women that, um, you know, use a clinic where they know that possibly now with an anonymity um, banished, that, you know, they, they don't know what their donor is going to be like. So it's a bit of um, anxiety there of, like, we, you know, if their child asks to meet the donor down the track... There's a bit of uncertainty about that, and but this way, all parties, you know, are comfortable. I'm comfortable with the people that I meet. That they're going, that I can feel confident that the children are going to a great home. Um, I have uh, women that they um, 
message me, we stay in contact. We you know we always have the um, ability to instant message each other. Although I don't um, play third wheel, um, so we let them go. Like, everyone gets on with their life. But you know, um, obviously we we've helped create a life together, and you know, there's a bit of, bit of respect and. Photos get sent out, um, sent donors' ways, and it's just a peace of mind that you can see as a donor going. You know, I get pictures of my children at their birthday parties, and I just go, I think, wow, these kids are really spoilt, and you know, you can see the smiles on the families' faces, and that, and that's enough for for me. You know, so I, I don't I don't lay up in bed at night wondering what these children are like or what they're doing. I already have that peace of mind, so I'm completely at ease. Uh, I have my own two children. Um, so donating at a clinic is not something I'd feel comfortable doing. Uh, well, I would donate um, at a clinic to a person that requires medical intervention, but I wouldn't donate my, um, my sperm and, uh, and honestly, um, because these children might not decide to come forward and, and so then my children are exposed to incest because unless the, the siblings all want to come together, they, you know, which not all of them do, you, you, you may never be aware of them. Sure. There's a lot of issues there that we that, that you've touched on, which I haven't got the time to delve into right now. But that's, again, around the world, there's different ways that there are regulations about the anonymity issues and about um, how the donor sperm process works. So I will put some links in the show notes to this and we are going to be talking about it more. But I want to bring in Johanna at this point. Johanna is Swedish and is in Australia and has travelled to basically work with Adam. He's going to be her sperm donor. Johanna, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. I should say, has already had had the donation from Adam. Tell me about that process, the decision to come to Australia. You've come pretty far. What had you done beforehand as far as finding a donor? Do you looked in Sweden? Yeah, so I actually been thinking about this for almost a year, I think, and then started looking to different options. And in my country, they just recently last year released like so single females can have sperm donation via the healthcare system uh, but it's a very long line because it's a short shortage of sperm donation within the country and also Sweden is very highly regulated as well so if you do get a sperm donor me as a female I wouldn't ha- I wouldn't have a say basically get a, at all of the sperm donation the doctor choose that for you and it sounds crazy the that years, you don't get a women, say the doctor choose the sperm donor for you but you, you do give some criteria, don't you? No. Uh, so the so you don't get to say that anything tra- that you want? No, they try to match you what you look like, like your own features. And you and sometimes you can ask for preference, uh, but the doc- it's up to the doctor. So they can say like, okay, I'll go with what I want. And then you have no say about it at all. Okay. That sounds bizarre. And that's one, bizarre. what's one of my biggest topic for me, like since um, I'm adopted uh, from another country, but I grew up in a very Swedish, I mean, growing up like all white people so I would I would want to have a child that looks like resemble like if you mix two people like two races to have the same kind of feature that my sister has children they are they are married with Swedish guys have children with them so they are like a little bit fairer skin than us but they still have of course our feature because they are dominant mm-hmm. and so I think that was one of my biggest topic that I wanted to be able to see like who do I want to choose as a donor because in Sweden since I would not be able to get any pictures nothing at all I mean that's a no-go you only maybe get like hair color um, um, eyes that's it uh, and the doctor choose that for you and in the past most women from single, single Swedish women have gone over to Denmark and there you can get a limited profile so you get to see like um, pictures of them as babies uh, the occupation they have today the age why they donate but for me it, that doesn't really say a lot either because for me I'm like okay but a child picture I mean no one looks like they did when they were like small children that's sure. it's a total difference when you're an adult so for that for me I'm like okay Denmark is off to the table as too and then I came upon Adam's group that I thought is altruistic they it's no money involved and I started like following some female on the web page just to see their stories and then connected with Adam as well, asking him questions, looking for some. I mean, I talked to a few people as well, not just Adam, before I decided where I wanted to go. So before you made the decision to come to Australia, you'd spoken with Adam. Had you seen him? You'd send, seen pictures? You'd Skyped? Had you? Or how, what, what was the contact? Yeah, so first we just uh, messenger via Facebook, uh, then we set up Skype dates, 
uh, just talking about it. And then we had like the first call was like a lengthy one and a half process. Then I asked all my questions that I want to have, like, how does it work? Uh, has he done it before? And uh, what contact does he have with previous uh, females? Things like that. So, I mean, I had like a long checklist of what things that I wanted to cover during this conversation. As far as the actual process, did you then go to a clinic to do it? Or we're we talking about artificial insemination that you've done. Were you both there together? It's not at the clinic, so it's artificial um, with a, well, with a cup and... This way has been, you know, obviously fresh sperm has been around for centuries, thousands and hundreds of thousands of years. It's, it's a proven method. It's actually a better process. As long as you get all the SED checks done, keep, you know, you keep check. I always do my donations via artificial insemination, so I don't, you know, I'm never at risk of actually, of actually contracting anything anyway. I need you to just kind of paint the picture for me. You told me that you're in an Airbnb, so am I assuming that you're both there, you give the donation, then Johanna she artificially inseminates herself and then as you've told me that she's now in the two-week wait Johanna you're now at this period where you're waiting but as far as like the guidance for what you did Adam is there support that you give for what the woman does like I, I just need to get my head a bit more around how the physical process works yeah so it, we try you know it's, it's it's as natural as possible obviously it's not using a penis um to <laughs> to, um, you know, obviously pass it from one body to another. It's um, sure. obviously it's artificial. So it goes into a cup first, and then the cup's used, um, sucked up through a, um, a needless sort of syringe, or there's um, a product called soft cups where you can actually directly deposit into a soft cup and that sort of acts as, um, as uh, it stops um, spillage from coming up. And you can press that up sure. against your cervical wall and leave that in there for um, a few hours. So um, basically it's... Um, you know, it's, I guess you could say it's um, an at-home version of IUI. Uh, obviously, with um, artificial insemination, though, I, for instance, I'd do eight mils. Um, with an IUI, you'd only get 0 0.5 mils, and half of that is the, the anti-freezing agent. So you actually get very little sperm um, in terms of count and volume when you do IUI. And uh, so there's less chance of that working than it is with um, artificial insemination at home. And Adam, you, you've talked about you've got children and that you're married. And I'm interested as to how your partner feels, because one of the things about doing this this way, um, not involving a clinic, is the legalities. Because whilst you've said that you're happy to have contact on instant message, messenger and a photo from a party along the way, you sound amazing in your approach to this all. Um, but as far as some of the other guys who might be part of your site, who's to say that they don't then, having gone through the way that you operate, turn around and say they want to have more involvement with that child because there isn't the legal framework in place that there is when a clinic is involved? No, look, that, that's a very good question. Um, in Australia, our law's a little bit better than the UK. So, for right. instance, um, under Family Law Act 70, um, 1975 uh, 60 h it means if you do donate via an artificial insemination procedure, you are considered the donor, not the father. And um, so that, you know, that protects people in that way. Okay. But in terms of the family court law and stuff, so for instance, our group, right, we have um, men that come on there that want to co-parent and women that, um, that come on there and want to co-parent. Uh, some of these women feel that, you know, raising a child with someone, they obviously they get to know them first and... Um, you know, and because they're not having a sexual relationship with each other normally, um, it's it's more focused on the child. So there's you know you, you don't have the the, the bickering um, that you'd get in a relationship, uh, so to speak. You know, with your own tensions. So it's all um, <laughs> child focus. So yeah. um, look, so for instance, the people that um, want to, to have something to do with the child's life, they're pretty passionate about writing that in in, the, in their post or their you know their way you know their welcoming introduction post, and that's the same with the women as well. So. So, um, so what? There's different horses for different courses, you could say. So, um, so there's no need for trickery because if you want to share a child with someone, there's that person out there that you can. If you just want to donate, then there's people, um, people there that you know are willing to raise that child. Um, and obviously, it's the opposite as well for the recipient that that they want to. Um, obviously, they don't want child support, so they. Um, Obviously, when you do child support, there's child custody. They go hand in hand. So, um, you know, 
we, we, I've been running this group since 2015 and I get, you know, all, like, any complaint. Like, if someone's late or not speaking within half an hour of not arriving, I'll get a message saying, hey, so-and-so hasn't rocked up yet. And, you know, so I'll, I'll hear any little complaint. We have never had a legal issue um, in this group and there's no one that's even threatened to um, come after these children or vice versa, child support. And in the UK, look, um, it's, it's similar. What you'd find is, is when people pick their friends, when, when someone picks their friends or a close relative or a person that's in their life, what you'll find is, is they'll ask their friend to donate and their friend will go, oh, they feel compelled to help them because obviously it's their friend. And then once the child is born, because they're in each other's life, they feel a bit more attachment. So if you look at the, the court history, all the cases that have happened in the past, it's, it's when people actually pick their friends. It's never been a case from someone picking a stranger, unless it's been a co-parenting situation. For instance, let's just say, for instance, me and Joanna um, are going to co-parent. We're not, we're not, but we'll just say, it, say that. And then Johanna goes back to Sweden, she meets a man, and the man says, well, no, I want to raise this child now. So then they try and kick me out of the picture. That's um, another issue that's happened in the past, when people try and push the co-parenting away after they've already agreed to it. So okay. They've, okay. Been the known, they've been the known cases that have happened legally. And um, in terms of this form of online donation, um, it hasn't happened. Uh, in, in regards to the UK scene, the... The thing about the UK scene is, like, yeah, there hasn't been any assaults happen. Um, you know, all that stuff that we heard, that, you know, I, which made me common. There hasn't been assaults happen, but in the UK side, they call it a free speech group. So what happens is you'll get a man come in there and he will say, oh, I think uh, um, uh, a child deserves a mother and a father, or I think lesbians shouldn't have kids, or I think single mothers shouldn't have a kid. Um, and then uh, obviously everyone arcs up and it's a fight. And they lay out, they lay out the drama, so the professionalism is gone, and and that's sort of the, what makes it ugly in the UK compared to what I'm achieving here. In my what I'm doing here is there's no discrimination. Everyone's you know, you post what you're comfortable with, your background, and the people that are happy to help are the ones that inquire about inquire about that. So you're just referring then to the Facebook, a UK-based Facebook group where you've seen some of those conversations happening. Is that right? Yeah, that, that's correct. Okay. Um, so it's, it's not right. a good look. I mean, sure. No, of course. And I think you've raised such kind of interesting points and you obviously know what you're talking about. I know that you've spent a lot of time and effort researching, not just for the good of the site, but for your own kind of own stance with all of this. Um, Johanna, I just want to get from you because you're in Australia, you're in the midst of your two yeah. week waits. You've obviously come a long way. Um, and Adam was saying before that you, you're going to be there for some time because if after this two weeks you haven't got a positive, you're going to have another go. As, as far as where you're at then in your fertile window, how long are you going to be staying in Australia? Just to kind of understand, because surely we need to go through your cycle again. Yeah, yeah so I arrived a few days ago and I'm leaving Australia 31st of December. So I'm back in my, in my country the 2nd of January. So that's just to be ensured like we were going to fit into two cycles in case the first one doesn't work. Okay. And then if the second cycle doesn't work, not wanting to put a downer on anything, in your mind, is this you'll come back to Australia or is this giving you the confidence to maybe go closer to home? I would consider me my, my other options as well, but both me and Adam talked before, like he might be able to actually travel to Sweden as well. So is that something, Adam, that you're starting to encourage within your community, that your donors travel, people don't just come to you, to Australia? Look, I, I, look, I'm pretty passionate. Like what I've achieved in Australia, I'd like people around the world to have that same opportunity. So obviously, um, in Sweden, for instance, Joanna, well, if she comes away and has a good experience, um, you know, she can inspire her friends or people um, in her area. And you know, this this has got a really good concept of actually working, and it's in it, and I've I've proven it um, through what I've laid out. And I'm happy to educate people in different countries to roll out their own system. People that you know. People go, oh, you know, it should be, regu um, um, should be banned or unregulated. Well, the governments are not, aren't going to do that. So someone needs to step up and take, you know, do what I'm doing in Australia. And I'm happy to give the time of day for anyone because, um, you know, at the end of the day, as I said before, that 
People like Joanna, they've got money. They, they, they can spend it at the clinic. It's not like they're desperate. She could have gone to Denmark um, from Sweden and used a clinic there. Um, obviously, her options, as she said, in Sweden sound quite bizarre. But, you know, um, she's obviously she's spoken to me and she's felt more comfortable using this way. You know, she's, she has the assurity that she's seen me and she's happy with my qualities. So in Australia and UK, it's quite similar. The... Um, Obviously, they don't get paid to donate. So, whereas in America, they obviously get paid to donate. So, you get a high candidate of people coming through because they want the money to support them through college and that. Which, you know, I think it should stay altruistic um, because when these children get older and they reach out, and the guys in America go, "Oh, sorry, I only did this for um, money during college. I don't really want to have much to do with you." I think it's quite sad on the child. So, UK and Australia got that um, sort of thing where they don't pay the donor, so it's more altruistic, but the clinics are disconnected. Um, they don't have someone inspiring enough to, like a donor, to speak out to them and inspire other men to donate. I mean, I've inspired so many men to come out and donate and make that step that, you know, and they've come back and thanked me and said, wow, this has had like a very positive effect on my life um, and I feel good and I thank you, Adam, for, um, you know, giving me the confidence to go ahead and do this. But what, what I found is, is some of the men who join and they say, hey Adam, no one's picking me to donate. Um, I've been on the site a few months now and, and no one's picking me. And um, some of these men have got um, gra grammar errors and like their, their terminology isn't that great or they're you know, a bit slangy or, or for instance their um, looks might not be appealing to the majority of women. And they say, hey Adam, we just want to help, what can I do? And I sort of give them a few tips and that, but, and then they say, well, I've gone to a clinic and I've donated there now at a clinic and they've accepted me. And, the, uh, and you know, I think that's really great that they've gone through the effort to go and do that to help people through an avenue, um, through that avenue, because they're obviously essentially they, they're going to help some families. But it does make you wonder that, you know, people are going to these clinics and they're paying top dollar and people aren't picking them for free. So it, it does show you that the information yeah. that you get, the information that you get from a clinic is very limited. As um, Gianna said, you might find out he's got brown hair or blue eyes, and um, you know. But you don't, you, you you can't see you can't see them or know how they act or how their personality is. Whereas you know these men here, they're meeting meeting these women, and they're you know, obviously for whatever reason they're not getting picked. But then they get, you know people are happy to use them at the clinic. So I think it's I think I find that fascinating. Um, yep. But I think good on them for do, trying to do a good deed. I think the reason why also this appealed to me is like I'm single. That's why I'm going down this route, of course, because I haven't been able to find the right guy at home. And I'm getting, I mean, in my late 30s, so I mean, time is, time is the essence. And one of these things that I definitely also like is that me and Adam would like, we kind of agreed like, okay, we can do annual checkups. So if I would have any question down the line, we say this works out. And then in five years, I would actually have some questions for Adam or thinking like, or we would still have that connection though. As a sperm donor, I would not be able to have any connection with a sperm donor until the child is 18 and if they want to reach out but not from yeah. on my behalf. No, I think it's amazing, Adam. I think what you have enabled, the relationships, all of that, I think is amazing. What I just want to also just clarify is the regulatory aspect of it with the screening process that you're going through. I'm assuming, I know you're aligned with the City Fertility Centre. So am I right to say that the with all the donors, the, the screening process is done through a clinic, the same clinic that's all kind of regulated, just to give people that peace of mind. Okay, so look, um, the clinic actually acts as a middleman. Um, right. We, you know, technology has come so far, far now. There's, you know, there's interventions and um, companies online that do all this. So, for instance, when you go to a clinic, um, you might get tested for cystic fibrosis, uh, fragile X. Um, you know, there's a few other things that they test for. I think, you know, there's only a handful, like up to five to ten things that each clinic tests for. You can go to Semaphore or 23 Me, and you can request your donor to do those tests and that will give you up to 180 different types of genes that you could have a deformity in and yeah. you can check on a higher scale. What I insist to all the ladies out there is go and get one of these more thorough tests, test yourself, see what genes that you've got, um, you know, what genes that you got deformed and if you have some that are concerned, 
then you know get your donor to get tested as well. So you can actually test for more doing this way than you can at a clinic. But obviously not everyone asks for that and some people are happy that you know um, um, to listen to the family medical history. See for instance I had um, I've got men that have donated online and donated at a clinic. A lot of men have donated at a clinic. So these um, these people that you pick a donor from a clinic and you think okay well there's only five to ten families out there. Well the clinic doesn't know that these men have donated online either, so there could be a lot more. There's no, you know, there's no screening for the clinic to actually protect that. And I, and and the men that I've spoken to, um, and they've said, you know, I've gone through a clinic and I've donated online. And when they sit you down, they ask you for family medical history, and they'll go through it. And they said, well, they felt less inclined to be more, um, to be honest with a clinic because they felt they already gone through so many hoops that they didn't want to get rejected. Whereas online they're more open because it's more casual. Um, if someone doesn't like them, then they can speak to the next person and tell them their traits. So I found that these men are actually more truthful online than they than they are to the clinics. So I found that a very interesting um, point that I've that I've come across in my in my time and in, in all this as well. Interesting but worrying that people are lying when we're talking about this when it comes to possible family medical issues that could present. But just to clarify, because we haven't got that long left to chat, the the testing that you do with all of your donors, all of your donors that you have on your site have gone through a specific amount of tests. There's STD tests. And you're saying that as far as more genetic related tests, that's something that is kind of left to the, the woman to have conversations with the donor? Yeah, because of, of course. I mean, because obviously this is a free, this is a free avenue. Sure. So, the women that, so the women that want that testing... Um, Obviously, they'll initially pay for the donor to go and do that, and obviously, then once that donor's done that, he's got those tests forever, I guess. And but um, so you know, if you're considering going down this path, you have that option to say, "Hey, I'll pay for you to do this test," um, and then you know, often it's a saliva or a blood test, and um, you know, I've never had a donor that um, hasn't been willing to comply with that. And then if a donor doesn't um, or doesn't want to do that, then obviously they're not the ones for you. So sure. Um, you keep looking so obviously we want people to come on here and we tell people it's it's all about your comfort level if you don't feel comfortable don't do it you know if you feel that everything's going on they're doing the little cry test obviously when they join these men um some of them just want to come in and have a look to see how it goes before they you know touch the toes in the wood before they you know go for a dip and they want to see how how it out plays we preach to all the women like when the women join the group they get a, a information guide and and tells them the guidelines of what to accept and and you know to do that and so obviously a donor might be in the group for a year so um, a person might say hey i want a more recent std test and in australia it's pretty good we get um bulk billing um, through Medicare, so costs aren't, aren't there. And then also um, you can get a free semen analysis as well in Australia. So obviously if you have a bulk billing doctor, you don't have to um, pay for a semen analysis. So that also tells you how um, the donor sperm is as well and the likelihood of um, falling pregnant from that. Fascinating stuff. Really interesting to chat. We're going to have to leave it there, guys. Yeah, thanks for having us, Natalie. So, Johanna, best of luck with it all. I really look forward to hearing the outcome, so do let me know. And I hope that your time in Australia is very enjoyable. And um, good luck with, with it all. Thank you. So I did ask Johanna whether she'd had success, which sadly she hadn't. But she did tell me that she's arranged for Adam to fly over to Europe. She's going to try one more fresh deposit in her next cycle. She's keen to continue going down this route. She wants to have that relationship with her donor. She likes his features. She likes his personality. She likes his altruistic mind. And she wants to keep in touch with him. So it's an interesting standpoint. As Joanna says, I'm a smart and well-educated woman. And she has a realistic view of the success because she is slightly older, whether it will work for her or not. She's also going to have him deposit some of his sperm for her if she needs to use it again and she's hoping to have a baby later this year or in 2020 so I'll keep you posted. Now I mentioned I also wanted to give the viewpoint of a male fertility professional Kevin McElhenney. I'm going to put Kevin's full statement in the show notes so do go and have a look. So this is part of what Kevin said. 
Whilst Adam has good intentions, I'm concerned that both donors and especially recipients are exposing themselves to physical, psychological, legal and financial risk. In licensed centres, the guiding principle is the welfare of the child and this is not being appropriately considered in informal donation. Adam mentions that he knows that the children will go to a great home. This is difficult to know after a few emails and a chat in a coffee shop. He mentions that the donor can be part of the child's life. This should not be a motivation for donation. How does he know that this arrangement will not cause future harm to recipient and child as well as to the donor's own family? It suggests a co-parenting agreement, which is something quite difficult and shouldn't be mixed up with altruistic donation. Kevin goes on to talk about medical histories and STI screens are meaningless unless they can be independently verified by a third party, for example, a doctor in combination with a fertility clinic, and the same applies to genetic testing. So there you have it. Kevin's response to what Adam had talked to me about. Like I say, I'll put more comments from Kevin and his details on the show notes. And if you have any questions about what's been discussed in this podcast, please do get in touch. Natalie at the fertilitypodcast.com is my email. I'm at Fertility Body on the different social channels. You can always DM me, of course. The whole point of what I'm trying to do is give you different viewpoints to help you ask more questions, to help you think more about what it is you're trying to navigate your way through. Okay, there's always more questions to ask and there's also no stupid questions. So please do get in touch and I will do my best to get your questions answered. Thank you as always for listening and until the next time.